Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, we'll give, I think, just one more second for people to join if anyone else wants to join us, and then we'll start. Let's give them just two more seconds. I think we're going to start now. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Guy, and today in our talk, we're going to be talking about how do you bring an LLM project and LLM applications from idea to production, and we'll talk about the AI infra that's needed for that. My name is Guy, and I lead the product at Quack. Um, I've been building with LLMs since early 2021, back when GPT-3 was, was out there, and there's no chat GPT. Um, I have a very broad tech background from many startups. I worked for Mercedes-Benz, Cisco, um, in the Israeli military. Quark is a company that is doing all the engineering for ML and AI for companies in production. We run models for companies such as Notion, OpenWeb, um, and more, and high AI scale. And we do all the engineering for that. And I think in today's talk, we're going to be talking about some really, really important things in today's ecosystem. So first, we're just going to have a brief overview of the LLM ecosystem and then the AI infra stack and how do we see this. We're then going to be diving into some tools in AI applications and then we'll share the LLM platform and the new addi additions to the Quack platform and show you a little demo of this. So just to start, I think it's clear for everybody, especially in this conference, that AI is currently moving at the speed of light. Um, this is from 2023, 2022, and if I show you this to release calendar of 24, it will just be infinite. So many new models, so many new advancements, and every kind of new week or every two weeks, we have a new model coming out. And also when it comes to video models, to multi-models, there's an infinite amount of models coming out. And in order to build really LLMs and productions or AI applications and productions, we have to be ready for this. Now, it's clear by now, but everybody wants AI. Companies want to leverage AI in every possible way. And I think what's interesting right now is that AI is moving from this experimentation phase, especially around LLMs and the multi-models, um, into real business transformation. Um, when it comes to cutting time and labor, to improve quality and efficiency of businesses, providing whole new experiences, and, and I think mostly also giving superpowers to employees. Now, we've done quite a large survey um, around LLM applications to multiple practitioners and multiple executives and tech companies. And you see that if you see the first question, half of them already have some sort of LLM application in production. And the other half that doesn't have any LLM application in production wants to have it. The second question is just a question of whether you're planning to do some or to deploy LLM applications. So everybody is planning on doing something of that sort. But just so we have the same context, what are AI applications? So we see AI applications as applications with multiple models, prompts, data pipelines, workflows that all create either custom AI endpoints, co-pilots of all sorts, chatbots, and of course, agents. Now, getting something from demo to production, especially in AI, is quite a big thing. Why? First, anything with 10 users is nothing like an application with 10,000 users. Um, and you need new tools to support this. Now, we've I think we've all tried or did some demos and experiments. And once you want to bring this to production and have this live in your business, you need to, to, to have many, many things in your mind. Now, before we kind of continue, I want to share with you how we see this and how we see this transformation. We help a lot of companies run machine learning and AI in production, and we're helping them also now do this transformation into bringing LLMs in production. This means bringing chatbots in production, getting them into thousands and hundreds of thousands of users. And I want to share with you how we think of this world and how we see it. So first, these are kind of our guiding principles in thinking of bringing AI in production. First, there's quite a gap or quite a huge gap between an AI model and AI products. There's a difference between just using prompts and models and really delivering value with AI-based products. Secondly, 
AI applications require really complex workflows. It's never just one prompt and one model. It's always a mixture of data, databases, drag retrievals, uh, multiple prompts, multiple models, all working together in tandem. Three, and this is one of the most important and most interesting, I think, is that new stakeholders and more stakeholders are now involved in building AI applications, whether it's product managers writing prompts, whether it's more analysts involved in evaluating applications, whether it's developers working together with data scientists. So we see this shared now more than traditional ML projects. Fourth, debugging LLM applications is very challenging. It's not enough just to see the request and the response. You need to really track every step of the way. You need to see every prompt and you need to understand every step of the way. Because of this non-deterministic nature of models, you really want to know every step of the way in order to try to debug this. Fifth, and I think this goes kind of back to the point I shared at the beginning of the presentation. There are new models coming every week, every month, every quarter, and you want to be able to um, improve. You want to be able to test. You don't want to be kind of sitting behind because we don't know when, GPT, when GPT-5 is going to be released, but you will want to test it, maybe Cloud 4, maybe Llama 4. So we know they're coming and we want to be prepared for this. Sixth, prompt and context and data are critical. It's not enough just to have a really good model. If you can't mix it up together with the proper context, the proper fresh data and the relevant prompts, you're never going to achieve a good outcome. Seventh, and especially when scaling kind of an application, balancing cost, latency, and quality matters. When your demo starts, you only do it with GPT-4, for example. Everything is API-based, and nobody cares about latency and cost. Whenever you start scaling, suddenly performance matters. Start, suddenly the OpenAI bill goes up, or even the quality uh, changes. So these things will matter once you grow. And eight, and this is also really interesting, GPU access is vital. Now, if you're just using AI providers as an API, maybe you don't care about this. But most projects and most companies, when they start scaling and experimenting, they want to deploy their own custom open source models. They want to fine tune models. They want to maybe um, scale inference. And they need to have proper GPU access. Maybe it's multi-cloud, maybe it's GPU cloud, but this is something you need to be prepared for because if you don't have GPU access, you won't be able to deploy these models. Now let's take a very basic example. This is one of our customers that deploys a chatbot. They're a very, very large um, hotel infrastructure company. Imagine kind of an Airbnb managing a lot of um, hotels and, and bed and breakfasts. And they created a chatbot with which users can book um, um, stayings. They can ask questions about availabilities. And in order to do this, it needs to be connected to their own databases. Now, in this diagram, you can see that there's kind of a big query that the company manages. And this is where all the, for example, bookings are managed. It needs to go through kind of a complex flow to get to an embeddings. Um, we use a vector store, we need to prompt it, we need to use, in this case, some GPTs. And this kind of a cycle is a must, and it's a very basic one. The real one is a bit more complex in order for users to really ask a question and get an accurate response. If you want to know if today there's an availability for a four, for a two queen bedroom, you need to know all the exact information um, when the user asks for it. Now, I think that when we speak about these AI applications, uh, we need to speak about the infrastructure behind it. Now, this is a, um, um, a diagram by Theory Ventures that I really like that kind of dissects the AI infra into four layers. First, there's the data layer. The data layer is how do we get accurate data for our prompt or for our AI application? This means really getting um, and data from our data sources. This means having accurate data in a vector store. This means getting, uh, retrieving accurate data from the vector store. And this means also storing it someplace. If we don't have this layer, we will never be able to really give accurate responses from our chatbot, for example. Then there's the model layer. This is also really interesting. We have the core or foundation models. 
either as an API, for example, OpenAI or Cohere, or maybe I want to deploy my own Llama 4 on my own deployment. Then there's a world of model routing, which means how do I choose the best model, maybe the cheapest or the most quality model for a particular question? Then there's actually, how do I serve this? How do I scale the GPU-based model? How do I fine-tune uh, models on large machines? And how do I manage and track my fine-tuned models? And then there's kind of an upper layer of deployment. I need to have observability and logging on all my requests coming to my applications. I need to care about security. I need to care about analytics. And I need to orchestrate all this. Um, and LLM Ops is what we'll kind of deep dive a bit into a bit, a bit more later. And it's kind of a whole new discipline that merges um, tr the traditional software with machine learning together. And then lastly, there's just the interface layer. I want to have an interface to talk to my application. Um, and at Quark, we, we focus on all these three layers, the data, model, and deployment. Now, once this bot, for example, this hotel chatbot starts growing, you will start feeling some growing pains. For example, users will start getting bad or wrong responses. Latency will become an issue. Um, you might get to one second responses or to 15 second responses or even more. Costs will start rising and your manager will start asking about this. And then, as I said before, let's say we'll have GPT-5. Let's say we'll have Cloud4. What do I do now? How do I test this? How do I change it? And how do I adapt my system to keep on working when these new models come out? Fifth, you'll have more and more prompts coming up. You'll have prompts in your flow. You will have different prompts when you update models. You will have different prompts when you experiment. How do you keep track of all this? And then six, you found a whole new prompting technique. You want to test it. What do you do now? Now, all these AI applications require their proper infrastructure to run and maintain. And there's an evolving ecosystem of new type of tooling uh, developed especially for this. For example, and we'll discuss and show this a bit later, tools for prompt management, tools for workflow management, tools for tracing LLM. This means tracing a call. Whenever you send a request to the chatbot, you want to trace every step of the way. You need to track cost and usage. You need to evaluate and monitor models, and monitoring and evaluating LLMs is difficult. You need to, tools for fine-tune your models. You maybe want to fine-tune on custom messages on your custom data. And you need tools to deploy these custom or open source models. So let's kind of start dissecting it bit by bit. And let's start from the survey on the right hand side. As part of the large survey that we did, we asked practitioners who is in charge of writing prompts. And this is also an interesting outcome because we see now that in AI applications, not only data scientists are in charge, we have developers writing prompts, we have product managers writing prompts, and of course, not to forget, we have prompt engineers. And this is, I think, one of the rising kind of roles that we see in LLMs. And these are people between developers, data scientists, or just um, AI enthusiasts who are really keen on how do I perfect this prompt and how do I know what's the best way to work with models. Now, prompts have become an integral part of the process. You can't have an AI application or an LLM application without having prompts as a first-class citizen. First, as we said before, you have more and more stakeholders handling prompts, whether it's PMs or developers. Um, you need to inject the proper context from the data sources you have or from the vector store that you have into the prompt. And if you don't manage this, you will never get proper responses. Prompt engineering is kind of this art between finding the right wording and also deciding on the right data. If you have a very large context, you don't want to always send the, all the information. You need to craft this. And then as kind of going back to these tooling before, you want to have proper A-B testing tools because whenever you change a prompt, you maybe not want to affect production. You want to just experiment. So you will have to have kind of prompt experimenting tools because again, the nature of these prompts is, is basically unknown. And then less, lastly, you wanna keep track of versions because as time goes by, you will update these prompts more and more and you wanna always keep track of things so you will be able to see what you've changed and maybe also revert. Now, workflows are really cool because all these AI applications or most of them work in flows, whether it's chains like function chains or just flows that you've, you define yourself. 
These AI applications require multiple models, data pipelines, RAG pipelines to retrieve context from the vector store, and also vector databases, which has kind of two types of workflows. One is online retrieval. When you ask a question, you want to retrieve data. And then also it's the offline ingestion. You need to make sure that the vector database is always up to date with the most accurate information. And also you need to make sure that you know how to deploy embedding models. Now you might choose only to use API based embedding models like ADA2 by OpenAI, but many of our customers deploy their own open source models or their own fine tuned embedding models. And then lastly, also function calls and external tools that you call within a workflow are stuff that you need to mitigate and, and visualize. Um, let's talk about model deployment. Now, as we all know, the open source model has been booming in the past month uh, with the release of Llama 3, and I'm sure we'll have more and more open source models coming, um, Mistral and such. Um, the ability of open source models to give you great outcome will increase. Now, we call them sometimes SLM, these kind of 7 billion uh, parameter models. You will want to have the proper tools to experiment with them. So sometimes you just want to deploy a vanilla Llama 3, just a regular one, and sometimes you want to fine tune it. And you will have to have proper infrastructure to do this. And if you don't have infrastructure to deploy and scale these models, you're going to be left hanging when you want to start experimenting with it, especially if you need to work multi-cloud or if you have some security and privacy requirements. And then this kind of brings me to model fine tuning. When you want to fine tune model, when you want to kind of inject it with your own data, sometimes you want to do it just to improve the model. Sometimes you want to do this so you can reduce the prompt sizes so you don't need to send as many examples every time to send to save cost. Now, versioning fine tuned models and experimenting with them is also something that's going to be changing on an ongoing basis. So you will have to have proper infrastructure to maintain and version this. Let's also talk about data pipelines. Now imagine, and let's go back to this hotel chatbot. Let's say all the information about hotels and bookings is in Snowflake. You want to always have the proper and fresh information available for your prompt whenever someone asks a question. Sometimes you will have to prepare this as features before this. Sometimes you will have to make sure that you can periodically ingest data into vector store. And as I said before, have the ability to deploy embedding models. There's quite a lot of compute in ingesting a lot of data into vector store. It's not just about storage. It's also about how do you create embeddings, both to store data in vector stores and also to retrieve data from vector stores. And then you have data pipelines and transformations from your data source into the prompt. Sometimes you will need to prepare data. Let's say it's financial data. You will need to have this prepared before a request comes to the prompt. And then also, lastly, you want to connect it either feature store or transform data and vector store together with your prompts. Let's talk about tracing. Now, tracing is one of the, I think, rising needs in LLMs, which is visualization of your LLM flows. Now, every time you get a request to your A application, it goes through multiple steps. These multiple steps are steps um, that um, 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 steps that um, um, we um, see what happens in the prompt. Um, I just saw that uh, there was a, mis a question about the connection, so I see that. I hope that everything's okay. Um, please write again if there's an issue with the connection. I'll make sure that we address this. Um, so I'll just continue, and I will address the questions in the chat um, at the end. Just uh, sorry for this pause. Um, so we want to debug these LLM applications and want to see what happens in every step of the way. We had a prompt, we had an input. What was the input? What was the output? Remember that the nature of these models is unpredictable. This is how they're built. So sometimes you will not get the output you want to get and you can't um, evaluate and test everything. So you need to see live what is going, what is coming from users and which requests and which responses they're getting. Also, let's talk about cost and tracking usage. Now, this is a really cool slide at Quill Twit from um, 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 a founder of an Israeli startup. Um, they're doing healthcare. They're very, very large. And this was his March, March 24. It's, I think, two months ago. This is the invoice to OpenAI. And he paid over 200K. And for him, it was great. Um, he says, like, okay, for me, it's fine. Uh, we're still making revenue on this. But 
in your eyes, imagine that this bill is coming and you're not prepared for this. Now, as time goes by, you will care about um, optimizing your, um, let's call it AI cost. It's either working with several AI providers, not just OpenAI, maybe OpenAI, Anthropic, Bedrock, um, Gemini, um, because maybe you get a discount from someone, maybe something is cheaper. So you will want to kind of and switch between them. And then also maybe you want to move in some store, some stage to an open source model. It's also possible in some stages, it makes more sense to deploy your own open source models and not use an AI provider. So this is also a concern you need to think about, especially when you start scaling. Um, almost lastly in these tools is evaluating models. Now, LLM evaluation and evaluating language is kind of an unsolved problem scientifically. Um, if we speak about machine learning and traditional, let's say, risk models or, or um, others, it's a bit more well-defined. But exactly defining whether your model is responding well is something that's still kind of in the making. Um, so currently, you can use custom evaluators or you can use some sanity checks, and some people use LLMs to check LLMs. But these are things that you will have to, to, to consider and use several frameworks um, and also use user feedback because there's no one single way to evaluate these models. Now, um, let's um, show you some really cool things. So first, just one word about Quack. Quack as a platform has existed for a, a, almost four years, and it's a fully managed end-to-end -end platform that has all the infrastructure, AI practitioners and data scientists, developers, everybody doing AI need to build, deploy and manage and monitor um, generative AI, LLMs, and oh, of course, classical ML and production. So our focus has always been really production deployments and really how do you bring these to companies and to have the real value. Now, just among the customer that we have is Notion, for example, GLA, Lightrix, that's also well known in generative AI, open web and language and some others um, whose machine learning is running on Quark and production. Now, the Quack platform has, let's say, three parts to it. So um, we are very, very strong in MLOps and data. So we have all the tools you need to build, train, deploy, and monitor models without any engineering kind of hustle. You just uh, use Python and you get everything you need. And also when it comes to data, to a feature store and data pipelines. And we're now adding and building new tools to add LLM, LLM ops into this mix. And why do we do this? Because we see kind of uh, one line going between um, LLMs, MLOps, and data. Again, as I said before, we need to create AI applications, open source model deployment, fine tuning, data pipelines, the vector stores. So we need everything together and everything works in, in, in kind of in one cycle. Um, and before we talk about the LLM platform and Quack, I want to show you kind of the Quack platform and, for example, how do you deploy Llama, Llama 2 or Llama 3. So, uh, wait, and I'll just need to share my screen again. Now I share my whole screen so you can see everything. Sorry for that. Yeah. So, this is the Quack platform. And the Quack platform, as you see it, includes models, features, vector store, workspaces, everything data scientists need to deploy models. Now, you don't need to do anything about engineering. We work on GCP, AWS. All you need to do is to write your Python code, and I'll show you this in a second. So imagine I wanted to deploy a Llama 2 model. So whenever I deploy a model, um, and this is, for example, in a live model, um, I can see all the engineering metrics. And while this loads, I just want to show you what's the code that's required to have a live model. So in Quark, um, we have um, um, what we call the Quark model. And the Quark model um, is basically um, a wrapper. So you need to implement two functions, a build function. This function happens whenever you train or build a model. This is just one time. And we have the predict function. Now, the predict function happens every time your model is called. So your model can be deployed as a real-time endpoint. It can be deployed as a batch endpoint. Um, but everything you put here will be called um, in a prediction. Now, let's just talk about the, the, the build function. Imagine I want to use an, an hugging face model. So all I need to do is get my hugging face token. I need to, in this case, call the tokenizer 
called the hugging face model. And then I can have a prediction, whatever I want. Now, this is in this case is a vanilla hugging face model, but it could be a trained model, a fine-tuned model. And all you need to do is basically just use Python and it will be deployed on every everything you need. Now, just going back um, here, sorry. Um, I want to show you how this is built. Now, what you see here is the builds table. Every time I build a model, and building a model is as simple as writing quack models build in a CLI, we get a new version of the model that we can deploy. How does it look? For example, whenever the model is built, I have access to all the build logs. I can see the code. I can see what's inside this model build. For example, this is the code we just saw. I can see the history of deployments. I can see what happened to it during training. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and if I want to deploy this model, all I need to do is just click deploy, choose the type of deployment, whether it's a batch model or real-time model, click next, choose the instance type. So we can choose any GPU we want. Uh, we're working on AWS. So we can work with any GPU instance that AWS provides or GCP. So you can use any GPU endpoint that GCP provides. Now in the future and coming up this year, we're going to be also integrating with some others and um, GPU cloud providers such as CoreWave or Lambda Labs. So you can also deploy your models on these GPU clouds. And then once you click deploy, that's it, your model is live. You can work with it with the REST API endpoint. There's a Python client, there's a Java client, a Go client. But it's basically as simple as this. Also, we have a full list of ready-made models. It's only one-click deployment, and you have a deployed build. Now, I want to show you what we're building um, to work with LLMs. And this is really fresh and new. And one of the things we're adding is really the ability to have AI applications as a first-class citizen. So to do that, we're adding prompts. And prompts will be a way to manage prompts on the Quack platform. So you will be able to define any prompt you want. You will be able to define any variable you want. You can connect this when you deploy the prompt to the feature store, to your own data sources, to the adapter store. You will be able to very easily track prompt history. So you can see what happened when you deployed prompts um, in the past. And also, you will be able to connect any AI provider. So let's say it's OpenAI that you can connect with your own token. Or you can connect to Quack. Let's say you deployed Llama 3 or um, something else that's open source, and you want to work with it. So you will be able to very easily work with prompts in any AI workflow you want. Now then, we'll also be providing workflow deployment. Now workflows are going to be deployable entities. Let's say I want to deploy a workflow. I will be able to see all the engineering metrics, the throughput over time, how many RPMs, how many tokens I'm using, what's the total cost. And then also, we're going to have a code-first approach to workflows. So you can first visualize this workflow. In this case, we have an environment called Quad Prod, and it's going to be doing some pre-processing, a rag retrieval pipeline uh, with an embedding model, in this case, deployed on Quack going to the prompt that we just saw that's managed on the platform, and then doing some post-processing. Now, as I said, Quack does all the engineering for you, so you can deploy multiple environments. And in this case, we have the Quack prod environment. And let's say I have also another one called Quack staging. Now, imagine you want to test a different prompt. So we'll be providing something we call shadow prompt. So you can keep the inference pipeline the same, and then you can deploy another prompt in parallel. Now, you will be able to see how this prompt behaves um, in the analytics view or in your view, but users will keep on getting the same um, prompt and the same responses. Or alternatively, you will be able um, to deploy another environment and another prompt whatsoever so you can experiment with it. And this is something very vital that we see that customers want to do, especially when you want to experiment with different prompts, maybe different models, and you don't want to be breaking things you've already done. Now, also, we're adding tracing, so you can trace these workflows, and you can see what happened in every step of the way. You can see what was the input to the prompt. You can see what was the output to the prompt. Um, and this way, it kind of gives you full visibility into the flow. Now, at the same time, you will be able to, as I said before, deploy any custom open source model 
or fine-tuned model that's been fine-tuned um, on the platform. Um, again, you don't need to worry about working with GPUs because we handle this for you. And you also will be able to save all the prompts on the platform so you can keep track on your prompts going forward. Now, everything is available via code, so you can get to it from Python, you can deploy this on Quark, and everything is very, very simple to use. So we see this, um, and I'll just go back to my um, presentation. Um, sorry again, I'll just share my tab. Yep. So we see this as the Quark LLM platform, and this will give you really full stack abilities to create LLM applications all the way from um, deploying custom fine-tuned models, open source models, managing prompts, and more. Um, yeah, um, you can sign up. We have a wait list currently up on uh, quack.com slash LLM. I'll also send the link here in the chat if you want to um, sign up and um, we'll let you know whenever it's live. We'll be happy to help you onboard the platform and have you deploy models. If you already want to start deploying open source models and the more, um, you're welcome to do it now. We have a lot of customers doing it right now, fine tuning and deploying open source models. And the workflow and prompts um, parts will be released um, in the coming uh, weeks. Um, I think if there's any question, this will be a wonderful time. I can, we have more time. I can share things again and show or answer any question that you have. Um, anything, let me know. And feel free to reach uh, via website. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm Guy Eschet. I'm the only one with my name. Um, or Quack. You can sign up. Um, contact us. Um, anything. So there was a question in the chat. What do I think about um, Quark benefit from Llama Factory? So I'm not sure I understand, but I'm, I don't know Llama Factory if it's a framework, too many factory uh, frameworks. But if you just speak about Llama and the whole trend around more and more open source models um, coming alive, I think um, it's great because you as a user developing applications will have a more, um, I think, variety of models you can use. So for example, let's say um, you want to deploy more models. Up until now, you really didn't have much choice in the open source world because the difference in quality between GPTs and other API-based models in open source was huge. But as time goes by, there's more value in these smaller open source models. Microsoft is releasing some, and Meta is releasing, and I'm sure they will release more. We have Mistral, we have others. So you will have more variety of things to choose from. And a platform like Quack can help you manage these deployments, manage how you fine tune these open source models, manage how you scale these platforms, because you need to create a lot of engineering um, around really maintaining versioning, maintaining deployments, um, especially if you want to connect this to other your cloud deployments on GCP, on AWS. Uh, we allow you to create an account with multiple environments. You can use easily GCP, AWS together. Um, and this is, I think, one of the biggest benefits in more and more open source models um, coming to our lives. Um, and then also connecting them with other uh, deployments. For example, I just read today that o OpenAI is releasing a classifier to detect deep fake photos. Now imagine that you will want to create your own classifiers for deep fakes or for generated text. So you will be able to do on the same platform these deployments and trainings of these models because uh, training classifiers is quite classic ML and also deploy these open source models. So I hope this um, answers that question. Sure. Um, let me know if there are any other questions. Otherwise, feel free um, to sign up at Quack and hit me up or send us any questions and we're happy to help or have any demo you want.
Thank you very, very much and have a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of the conference.